back when I was doing my PhD, I lived with these two guys in a shared house on 20th Street in South Slope, Brooklyn. They were both doing their doctorates too, both crazy smart guys, and the whole idea was that we kept the house somewhere quiet and free of parties so we could actually get work done. One of the guys, we'll call him Andy, always respected that arrangement, as did Steve, the other guy that I lived with. Only, Andy was in a relationship with a girl who was not good for him. Maybe it was the other way around, maybe he wasn't the nice guy I always figured he was, and it was him that was bad for her. Either way, I think they fought more than they got along, and over a few months in the spring of 99, things between them got worse and worse. They used to fight like cats and dogs anyway, and I lost count of the number of times Andy came home in a bad mood because of something she'd done or said. It got to the point where he just seemed angry all the time, but as much as we politely suggested he just end the relationship, he just couldn't seem to do it. I don't think I'd have minded so much if he just kept it away from the house, but he was always bringing the girl over, taking her up to his room and after a few hours, these huge fights would break out with shouting and screaming and crying. And in a time before noise-canceling headphones, this was a major problem for me and Steve. But then came this one fight between Andy and his girl that started to sound less like a verbal one and more like a physical one. I remember my room shaking a little, taking off the old school foam coated headphones I was using to try and block the sound out and thinking, uh oh. There were a few more bangs and crashes, then I heard a door slam, and then I heard the sound of Steve and Andy having some sort of conversation in the hallway. From what I could tell, Andy then ran down the stairs and slammed the front door of the house as he walked out into the street. Next thing I knew, Steve is knocking on my door and he doesn't wait for me to answer before he walked in. I'm worried about Andy and Layla, he says, which I honestly thought was kind of funny at the time because we were always kind of worried about Andy and Layla, which was the name of the girl he was dating. He catches me kind of smirking about the whole thing, which I know was cynical of me, but I was just so sick of the whole thing at the time, and he follows up with something like, No, dude, really, like, he's just done something. I asked what made him think that, as apart from the crashes and bangs, it was basically no different from any other fight they had, and I figured all the noises were from slamming doors or punching walls or whatever. He then told me that it looked like Andy had blood on his knuckles, but again, it was nothing that wall punching couldn't account for. Steve then insisted he go check on Andy's room to make sure that nothing had happened, and I thank God he persisted because if we just kept ignoring things and plotting Andy's eviction, things might have escalated where irreparable damage was done. So, we walk over to Andy's room, expecting maybe a few dents in the wall and some smashed CD cases or something. We knew Layla liked to break his CDs whenever she was mad. But then, when we go to open the door, it was locked. Andy never locked his room. We were just at this level of trust where he didn't expect each other to go nosing around each other's rooms, and if we did, there was probably a good reason for it. Borrowing something, borrowing a few quarters, or some paper, that sort of thing. So, the fact that Andy's room was locked all of a sudden, that was just a major red flag to us. We knocked on the door, not really knowing what to expect from it, but we were greeted with silence, so we figured Layla had left the apartment before he did. Right after that, another one of our discussions about getting Andy out of the apartment started, how he was making it difficult to work, how we didn't want him affecting our progress and whatnot. Then, right as we're talking, we hear something coming from inside Andy's room. It sounds weird, but I honestly thought it sounded like a cat at first. It was like this long, drawn-out yowl or something, only... Because we knew Andy didn't have a cat, there was only one thing it could have been. Me and Steve gave each other a look as if to be like, Oh God, it's Layla. So we knocked on the door again and asked if she's okay. And again, we're greeted by some long drawn out groan. And that's when I start to get really, really scared for her. What kind of condition had Andy left her in that she was just totally unable to get a word out? What state was she in that... All she could do is reply with a groan like that. We started hammering on the door again, asking Layla if she could say anything, 
if she was able to unlock the door, that kind of thing. Then, as the moments ticked by, her groans started to sound a little more lucid, more like grunts or cries, and that's when we realized that she might be gagged. We knew we had to do something about it, and that thing was calling the cops and the EMTs before smashing the door from its hinges. Only, we're PhD students, not bodybuilders, and the doors and house shares were pretty well built, so no matter how much Hollywood-style shoulder banging or door kicking we were going to do, it probably wasn't going to be enough. That's when he said about running around the house, looking for something heavy enough to bash the door down. We had a few old tools lying around, but it's not like we knew how to use them to dismantle the door handle and unjiggle the lock or whatever. We also knew that just a hammer and a wrench weren't going to be enough to bash the door down. Maybe to bash a big hole in it, but that would take time. And it turned out it was time we didn't have because right when we were debating whether or not to start bashing, Andy returns home. All we heard from the kitchen was the front door opening and closing, so we cut him off in the hallway with an initial question of, what did you do, dude? He tries to pass it off like there's nothing going on, looking at us like we're crazy and then trying to get past us to the stairs. And that's when I noticed that he's holding something in his hand, something that's wrapped in a brown paper bag. We start asking him, what's in the bag, Andy? But again, he plays it off like we're acting all crazy and asks us what's with all the questions. Thankfully, we'd already called the cops by that point and they'd assured us that they were on their way. The only trouble was, we had to leave the door open for them and Andy had just closed it. I wouldn't normally be worried about going to open it again, but I was very concerned about what Andy had in his bag. He starts telling us to get out of the way of the stairs. We tell him we can't do that, and he knows why too. That's when his facial expressions change drastically and he gets this really dark and frightening look about him. We tell him that the cops are on their way, and then we ask him again what's in the bag. He doesn't reply, and for a second, I thought he was about to reveal a hatchet or knife or something from the bag and start swinging at us. But he didn't. He just backed up towards the door, giving us the same furious look without saying a word. Then as quickly as he showed up again, he just left. Steve later said that we should have at least tried to detain him, like jump him and then just keep him in place until the cops arrived to arrest him, but even the cops agreed that was a bad idea. He was in a very, very violent mood that night, and if what we believe he was planning is correct, I don't think he'd have had much of a problem hurting us, maybe even as bad as he was planning on hurting Layla. And speaking of Layla, the reason why she sounded like she was gagged was because that's exactly what happened. Andy had knocked her out, then tied her up and gagged her to keep from going anywhere. He knew she'd go to the cops about him hitting her and he wasn't prepared to let that happen. We still don't know what he had in that bag, but we're pretty sure it was something to finish the job that he'd started on Layla. We didn't hear about him being arrested or anything. Andy had come to NYU from Arizona, so it's possible he just fled back there somehow and has kept a low profile ever since. Or maybe he was arrested and we just didn't hear anything about it because after he ran away that night, he basically dropped off the face of the earth. If he was arrested though, the officers we dealt with that night certainly didn't hear anything about it, but they were basically beat cops, so I'm not sure how far their informational reach was in that way anyway. Whatever happened, I'm almost certain we'd saved two lives that night, Layla and Andy's. I'm obviously more pleased that we saved Layla's as no matter how irritating she could be, no one deserves that kind of treatment. But I know we saved Andy's too because if he had killed her or done any serious irreparable damage to Layla, he'd be in prison now for a long, long time. The scariest thing I ever saw in college is probably not what a lot of you are expecting to read. I'm seeing a lot of answers about crazy roommates or creepy professors who got fired after making advances on their students. Heck, I've even read a few half-decent ghost stories. I mean, not ones that I believe, but they weren't half bad as stories. My story, on the other hand, isn't nearly as dense or traditionally horrifying. 
and unlike some of these longer and more drawn out stories, it was over and done with in just a few seconds. Basically one night when I was out drinking at this one place that was easy to get into without getting carded, I watched a guy just waltz up to the bar while I was drinking with friends, drop something into a girl's drink, and just fade back into the crowd. I don't mean to sound like I admire this guy because what he did was something only the scum of the earth do, but the way that he was just so stealthy and smooth about it, I mean, he should have been working for the CIA poisoning Russian warlords or some nonsense, you know what I mean? He managed to move in and out of there in a way that people just didn't look at him at all. I mean, people could see him, but he managed to just like blur into the background so that barely anyone paid any attention. I mean, if I hadn't been looking at that exact spot at the bar, I wouldn't have caught it, and neither did anyone else as far as I know. Obviously, the first thing I did was notify the bartender, and of course, I told the girl too. He exchanged the drink, no questions asked, then directed me towards one of the bar's bouncers, who asked me some questions about the guy. I told him everything I could, what he looked like, what he was wearing and stuff, but I never found out how it ended up. It's just scary how fast it happened, and I guess he must have been watching from somewhere and then just scrammed when he saw the drink had been exchanged or whatever. I'd heard a lot of stories about that kind of thing happening, I just never thought that I'd ever see it with my own eyes. And this is in 2017 too, like way after the whole big scare about it, and there was a guy just still trying the same old thing of drugging girls, so he could probably do some evil stuff to them. So I used to know this girl in college who started out really sweet. Like this real wholesome Midwest girl who came from a super church-going Christian family. And for the sake of anonymity, we'll just call her Kate. College was her first real taste of freedom and with that freedom came certain privileges, as well as certain temptations. We were the ones who got her the first wine cooler she ever drank, and as horrible as it sounds, it was fun to corrupt someone pure like that. I mean, she wanted to drink, and the way we saw it, it was either we let her do it in a controlled, safe environment like our dorms, or she might go out and do it somewhere not so safe, with people who didn't have her best interests at heart. We used to drink once a week at the most, and only on weekends, mainly because it was hard to scrape the money together and to find someone or somewhere that wouldn't get us carded. But then, after a few months of purely weekend drinking, Kate started wanting to drink on a Tuesday or Wednesday too, just to break the week up for what she called hump day drinks. I know she borrowed the concept from other students who did the same thing, but we just couldn't handle being hung over in the middle of the week, especially if we had assignments or early morning classes. Sure, we did it once or twice just to live some of that wild college life, but after a while, we all started being like, Kate, chill, we don't have the money, or... Kate, chill, we got classes in the morning. She started out like a good influence on us, but after the holidays came and went, it was like we had to be the good influence to her. Then it got to the point where when we didn't want to party midweek or all weekend, we were lame or weren't living to the fullest or whatever phrase she borrowed from the burnouts who were all destined to drop out during their sophomore years most likely. This all built up to Kate just ditching us in favor of a much more party-oriented friend group, which we were real sad about, but there was a lot of cattiness involved, so it's not like we reached out or tried to help her. It wasn't until she needed it most that we tried to actually help her. I remember coming back to the dorms one day when I walked into the corridor that me and most of my little friend group were stayed in. I immediately knew something was wrong when one of them came to meet me in the hallway. She had this look on her face like she'd just seen a ghost, and I use that phrase very carefully too because when I went into her room, it was like I'd seen a ghost too. Sitting on her bed, having lost a ton of weight, was Kate, and when I say she looked like a ghost compared to the girl we once knew, I really do mean that. She looked like she'd died and come back to life or something, like she was a zombified version of herself. I could barely believe it was even the same girl. My friend said that all she'd done when she first showed up at the dorms was cry, 
so it was hard to get the actual story out of her for a while, but here's the gist of what happened to her in the time that she'd been away from us. As you can probably guess, Kate started partying more and more with her new friends, but she found out that they were into way more than just drinking. They were smoking a lot of pot, taking molly, and even doing coke when they could get it. Some of them were these rich Rhode Island girls who got a monthly allowance from their parents, and their dealers knew it, so they kept giving them stuff on credit and then collecting the debt every couple of weeks. Katie didn't have that kind of luxury, though. Like her parents supported her, but only when it came to buying books and whatnot. But what she did have was a completely clean slate with some of the dealers her new friends were buying from, and when they maxed out their credit with them, I'm not sure how much that was, they pushed her to buy on credit. She said she was scared to be in debt at first, but after the partying started, she basically forgot all about it, especially with her new friends saying that they'd cover her debts when the time came to collect. Like I said, I don't know how deep she was in with them, but it must have been a whole lot because when it came time to cover her debts, her new friends basically ghosted her. And that's when the threats from the dealer started coming. And they were calling her phone like non-stop, sending her all kinds of threatening messages and stuff, and that's when she came running to us for help. She wanted us to hide her, keep her clean, help her get her life back on track, and honestly, we were only too willing to help her like that. We stopped drinking in solidarity with her, basically cut out anything remotely tempting so she could get herself back to normal. We helped her get a new number, helped hide her away from her new friends, who were anything but... We thought she was doing so well, but then, one day, Kate just disappeared. She stopped showing up to our dorm, stopped answering her phone, and she stopped going to classes, too. First thing we did was head over to her dorm, and since she had a room on the ground floor, we were able to go around back to see if any of her stuff was still there. As far as we could tell, she'd left everything behind. Clothes, shoes, laptop, only thing we couldn't see was her phone. But since her charger was still plugged into the wall socket near a desk, she couldn't have left without that, and expected to be able to use her phone. We just went straight to the campus police and told them everything we could, and when they couldn't find her anywhere around campus, they got police from the wider area involved too. We were hoping that when they got in touch with Kate's parents that they'd find that she just dropped out and gone back home to, you know, properly dry out, escape the dealers, but that just made things worse. Her parents hadn't heard from her at all, and she certainly hadn't moved back west. I think this is where giving her some anonymity is really in order, because at first her parents couldn't believe she'd gotten into drinking and drugs in the way that she did. Then, when it finally sank in, they were absolutely devastated. And that was probably the most heartbreaking thing, seeing the pain that her folks went through when they realized their precious little angel had been corrupted by life on the East Coast. They did a couple of very emotional public appeals, one just for the college, then one for the tri-state media. No one came forward, so after that, Kate's name officially made its way onto missing persons registers, both national and regional. I'd like to say that there's an ending to Kate's story, and a happy one too. But that's all I have right now, not until she turns up somewhere, either dead or alive. Officially, she's just a missing person, and I hope to God she's still alive somewhere. But the idea of her just being out there, making it on her own with no money or whatever, it doesn't fill me with hope. I feel like it's just a matter of time before she's finally found, and I'm definitely not looking forward to that day. And that's mainly because I feel like me and my college friends have to shoulder some of the blame. It was us that got her into drinking, and when I look back at it, we should have kept her away from it like it was the freaking plague. I don't think I'll ever really forgive myself in that way, and no matter how many people tell me that what happened isn't my fault, there will always be a part of me that feels as if I'm the one that killed Kate. So this miniature nightmare happened many moons ago way back when I was just a naive little sophomore in college. It's something that's always stayed with me, and although it wasn't the sunniest of college anecdotes to tell my eldest before she left for Dartmouth, 
I feel like it properly prepared her to practice caution, especially when it comes to alcohol and those she imbibes with. So, this one night, I accompanied a girlfriend of mine to a friend of her boyfriend's. It was his birthday bash, so naturally she got herself an invite. Only trouble was, he'd only invited one girl, her. She then asked him if she could invite one of her friends so she's not the only lady there, and being the nice guy that he was, her boyfriend says, sure, OP can come along too. I mean, it kind of helped that I had a car and could give her a ride, but I didn't mind as she always gave me gas money out of her waitressing tips, so I didn't mind driving. The party is over at his dorm, which was sectioned off into what were basically a bunch of different shared apartments, and... After a night of laughs, dancing, and heavy, heavy drinking, we all basically crash into our different rooms. Most of the boyfriend's guy friends left, but obviously the other guys who lived there retired to their separate bedrooms for the evening. My friend goes into her boyfriend's room for you-know-what, and I'm left sleeping on the couch. I'm pretty wasted, so I think I was out within seconds of my head touching the couch cushions, but God knows how long later I wake up to this figure standing in front of me. I couldn't make out which of the boyfriend's roommates it was, but I kind of sit up like, who in God's name is that? And I literally just hear a drunken slur of, oh, you're not supposed to be awake. Sorry. And then whoever it was walks back into the bedroom. Not supposed to be awake. I mean, what would he have done to me if I hadn't been awake? That I try not to think about as I gathered up my stuff and walked out to my car. I was still blasted, and I know it was super irresponsible of me to not just get a cab. But at the same time, and I'm not using this to excuse driving drunk, would you want to hang around that apartment where some stranger tried to touch you? I think what was just as bad as the whole incident was the fact that when I told my friend and her boyfriend about it, they just sort of laughed it off like, Oh, that's just X. He's kind of weird when he's drunk, but I'm sure he didn't mean anything by it. I know she just didn't want to start any drama with her boyfriend because he and X were pretty tight with them being roomies and all. Let's just say I found out how much of a friend she really was that day. And how even though she helped with gas money, at the end of the day, all she was very interested in were her own interests. And needless to say, I did not drink with any of them again. Back when I was a broke college student, I worked part-time in a fast food restaurant for beer money. I worked there on and off for two years and whenever winter rolled around, we could get a lot of homeless guys just stopping by to keep out of the cold. We let them hang around if they didn't bother customers, which sadly was only a rare handful. It wasn't nice, but we had to call the cops a lot. It was no problem getting rid of the bad ones, and we took a lot of pride in taking care of the nicer guys, giving them coffee and other stuff. But then there was this one dude who never did anything we could toss him out for, but that bothered just about everyone in there, staff, customers, and homeless guys alike. I remember the night he showed up, this real young guy, about my age, with extremely pale skin and this almost blank expression and he gave us workers the creeps because sometimes all he'd do was just stare at us while we worked. Whenever we returned the guy's glance, he wouldn't even pretend he wasn't looking at us. He'd just stare right back, the same blank expression on his face, almost like he was looking right through us. So I'm sure you can understand why we all got such bad vibes from this guy. After about two weeks, the guy stopped showing up, and honestly... None of us thought too much about it since we were just glad to see him gone. Then, maybe like a month or two later, one of my coworkers goes off on break, then comes running back like two minutes later, waving his phone around like a crazy person. When we looked at what he had up on his screen, we all saw an article from a local news site showing a young guy who was in jail for attempting to murder his mom. The story said that he stabbed his mom almost 20 times which was disturbing enough. But then the picture attached to the article made it all the more chilling because it was the same guy who came into our store for those two weeks. Made me think how close some of us were to getting that same treatment. 
Because, I mean, if a dude will just stab his own mother like that, how would someone he didn't care about fare if they made him mad or something worse like that? Back when I was still in medical school, I examined a guy who had a horrendously infected foot. Most of the toes were necrotic and black and the rest of the foot wasn't doing much better. I wouldn't be surprised if he was waiting on amputation. The room smelled like death. Anyway, these rooms are small, with typically two beds in them. Because of the smell from his infection, the other bed is empty. As I'm passing his bed, I accidentally brush my leg against his infected foot that had been sticking out of the covers and hanging off the bed. His big toenail comes off onto my leg. It just stuck to my leg. We look at each other in horror. I clear my throat, ask my usual questions, then wish him a good day. I leave calmly, then run to the nurse's station to ask for help getting this dude's entire necrotic toenail off my leg. The nurse got it off, soaked that portion of my pant leg in some disaffectant liquid that smelled like it could have taken the pain off a car. Definitely the worst moment I had before I actually got my MD. At approximately 11.25 a.m. on August 1st of 1966, a 25-year-old architectural engineering student at the University of Texas arrived at the Austin campus's main building. He was pushing a small dolly, one which carried a large and heavily packed footlocker, but as he wheeled the dolly toward the building's main elevator, he found it wasn't functioning. It was then that a helpful employee named Vera Palmer approached and asked if he'd like her to activate it for him. Thank you, ma'am, the student said. You don't know how happy that makes me. Standing at 307 feet tall, the university's main building is perhaps the most prominent and easily recognizable building on the entire campus. At the time, it was largely an administrative building, but its 28 floors also contained a three-floor life sciences library and the university's herbarium. Yet on the 28th floor was a large observation deck, one which looked over the entire Austin campus, and it was the same observation deck that was the engineering student's intended destination. Once he arrived on the observation deck, the student ceased to push the locker-laden dolly, kneeled down, and opened it. After reaching inside, he produced a scoped, bolt-action Remington Model 700, one of the most accurate, long-range rifles ever produced. 51-year-old Edna Townsley, the observation deck's receptionist, gasped as the student produced the rifle and pushed to raise the alarm. But the student caught up with her and sent the butt of the rifle crashing into the back of her skull. Once she was downed, he smashed the butt into her forehead, causing a catastrophic brain injury, then concealed her unconscious body behind a couch. Two visitors then entered the reception area from the observation deck and were understandably startled to see a man with a firearm standing before them. Yet the student just smiled, acting as if he belonged there and gave the pair a cheerful, Hi, how are you? They returned the greeting, headed to the nearby elevator, then returned to the building's ground floor. They later said they believed the student was there to shoot pigeons, whose feces were a constant annoyance to the deck's visitors. But the student was not there to hunt pigeons. He was there to hunt people. His name was Charles Joseph Whitman, and one of the deadliest mass shootings in U.S. history was about to begin. Born on June 24th of 1941 in Lake Worth, Florida, Charles Whitman's early life was marred by vicious domestic violence. His father was a perfectionist authoritarian and nothing his family ever did seemed to reach his impossibly high standards. His father was also an avid firearms enthusiast, who began teaching Charles to shoot from a very young age. Charles became proficient in cleaning and maintaining weaponry, and by his teenage years, his father boasted that his son could plug the eye out of a squirrel from a hundred yards. Following his graduation from high school, Charles decided on a career in the U.S. Marine Corps, Life in the Marines suited Charles, who impressed his instructors with his sharp discipline and even sharper shooting. 
He scored 215 out of a 250 on his marksmanship tests, earning himself a sharpshooter's badge in the process. Then, when his commanding officer noticed how intelligent he was, he was encouraged to apply for the Marine Corps scholarship program. This would involve him attending college so that he'd be worthy of becoming a commissioned officer. Charles enjoyed his time at college, earning a reputation as a fun-loving hellion among his many friends. But there was a darker side to Charles, too. He was once caught butchering a deer in his dormitory, and a friend recalled how he once gazed out the lofty exterior of the campus's main building before remarking that a person could stand off an army from the top of that thing before they got him. Although Charles met his wife while studying at UT Austin, his grades were not up to scratch, and he was forced to leave Kathleen behind while he returned to the Marines. Charles was extremely resentful of the move, and back at North Carolina's Camp Lejeune, his conduct grew increasingly worse. In November of 1963, he was court-martialed for gambling, usury, and possession of a personal firearm on base. Following a court-martial and a demotion from Lance Corporal to Private, he was sentenced to 90 days of hard labor. Even after being demoted, Charles still enjoyed his time in the Marine Corps, but the separation from his wife was beginning to wear him down. He frequently expressed adoration for her in a diary he kept, as well as a desire to leave behind a life he loved just to be close to her. Just over a year later, Charles did just that, successfully receiving an honorable discharge before enrolling at UT Austin. Just two months before the day of the UT Austin shooting, Charles' mother announced she was leaving her father due to the prolonged physical abuse. Charles welcomed the decision and drove to Florida to help his mother to move to Austin. He was so afraid that his father might hurt his mother as she prepared to leave that he asked a police officer to stand guard as she did so. After his mother had settled down in Austin, Charles' father spent the modern-day equivalent of $8,000 on long-distance phone calls as he begged her to come home. He also made hundreds of calls to Charles, who found the experience so stressful that he began abusing amphetamines to cope with the stress. He also began to experience extremely painful headaches, and despite several trips to a doctor, nothing seemed to alleviate them. It's not clear how long Charles had been planning on carrying out the shooting, but it's suspected that on the day preceding it, he decided that he simply couldn't take any more. At around 6.45 p.m., Charles began typing the note that he would leave behind, with one section reading, I do not really understand myself these days. I'm supposed to be a reasonable and intelligent young man. However, lately I've been a victim of many unusual and irrational thoughts. These thoughts constantly reoccur, and it requires a tremendous mental effort to concentrate on useful and progressive tasks. The note continues with Charles requesting that he be medically examined following his death, the goal being to determine if something was biologically contributing to his desire to kill. Charles also stated that he wished to save his wife and mother from the cruel, hurtful world they inhabited, and that this would serve to save them from the shame of the terrible crime he was about to commit. Although he did not mention it directly, this is undoubtedly a reference to the bloodshed he planned to unleash on the students of UT Austin. Shortly after midnight in the early morning of August 1st, Charles drove to his mother's Austin apartment, crept into her bedroom while she slept, then stabbed her through the heart with a sharpened combat knife. When police discovered the lifeless corpse, a handwritten note had been placed next to the body. To whom it may concern, it read, I have just taken my mother's life. I am very upset over having done it. However, I feel that if there is a heaven, she is definitely there now. I am truly sorry. Let there be no doubt in your mind that I love this woman with all my heart. Following the murder of his own mother, Charles then returned home where he repeated the act of sneaking into his wife's bedroom before killing her while she slept. Once she was dead, he continued typing up his note. I imagine it appears that I brutally killed both of my loved ones, he wrote, but I was only trying to do a quick and thorough job. If my life insurance policy is valid, please pay off my debts, then donate the rest anonymously to a mental health foundation. Maybe research can prevent further tragedies of this type. Give our dog to my in-laws. 
Tell them Kathy loved him very much. If you can find it in yourselves to grant my last wish, cremate me after the autopsy. In the envelope, he slid the note inside, and he wrote in blue ballpoint pen, 8166. I could never quite make it. These thoughts are too much for me. Later that day, just as Charles was set to begin the massacre, Michael Gabor, his wife Mary, and their two sons, Mike and Mark, walked into the observation deck's reception area. They were in Austin visiting Michael's sister, Margaret Lamport, and she had accompanied them on a visit to UT Austin. Upon seeing them, Whitman grabbed a loaded, sawn-off shotgun from his footlocker and fired on the two Garber boys, hitting Mike in the shoulder and Mark in the head. As their parents fled, Charles followed them into the stairwell and fired down at them, hitting both Mary and Margaret. Margaret would later pass away as a result of her wounds while Mary was left paralyzed from the neck down with severely impaired eyesight. Moments later, Charles took the exterior of the observation deck and looked down at the vastness of the UT Austin campus laid out before him. Charles could see literally hundreds of people going about their business below, and all of them were potential targets of his murderous wrath. Not only could Charles target almost every square foot of the UT Austin campus, but he also had a perfect view of nearby Guadalupe Street, which was home to coffee shops, bookstores, and other student hangouts. And with that, Charles took a deep breath, shouldered his rifle, and took aim at the innocent people below. The first unfortunate soul that came into Whitman's sights was 18-year-old Claire Wilson. Claire and a fellow student named Thomas Ekman were departing the UT Austin Student Union when they fell into Whitman's sights, and there may have been an extremely disturbing reason why Claire was the first of Whitman's victims. She was eight months pregnant, visibly with child, and Whitman chose to shoot her square in the abdomen. Her unborn son was killed instantly when the bullet struck her, and as Thomas Ekman rushed to their aid, he too was shot in the chest. Ekman died instantly as a result of the gunshot, while Claire spent the next three months recovering in the hospital. Whitman's third victim was 33-year-old Robert Boyer, who bled to death after a rifle bullet struck him in the lower back. At the time of his death, Boyer had been working on a paper which outlined a method of mapping out extraterrestrial black holes. This paper was posthumously published in 1967 to critical acclaim and his name now lends itself to the boyer Lindquist coordinate system. Next to be shot was 31-year-old Devereaux Huffman. Devereaux was stopped dead in his tracks by the horrific sight of Boyer shooting and received a bullet through the arm. He was only saved from an execution by the fact that he audaciously feigned death, laying still so that Whitman wouldn't target him again. Whitman then turned his attention to the nearby Guadalupe Street, where he spotted three Peace Corps volunteers on the way to lunch. David Matson, Roland Elke, and Tom Herman hadn't heard the gunshots coming from the top of the main building and only realized something was happening when a bullet ripped off a chunk of Matson's wrist. This same bullet then fragmented into pieces on the wall behind them, and a piece of the bullet shrapnel tore its way into Elke's arm. Roland Elke dived into cover, waited a few moments, then emerged to try to drag his wounded friend to safety. Whitman then fired a round which hit Elke in the leg and sent him crashing into the pavement beneath him. Homer J. Kelly, a shopkeeper who watched the two boys getting shot, rushed to their aid and attempted to save their lives, but he too was shot in the leg as he attempted to save them. Whitman then spotted 22-year-old Thomas Ashton approaching the scene, a friend of the Peace Corps volunteers who intended to meet them for lunch. Whitman put a single bullet through the young man's chest, which snuffed out his life in an instant. 21-year-old Nancy Harvey and her friend Ellen Eugenides were just exiting the main building for their lunch break when they heard the shots echoing around the area. They immediately ran back inside the building and informed a security guard of what they'd heard, yet the security guard assured them that he'd received no word of any gunfire around the campus and told them it was safe to leave. They walked back out of the building just in time for a brief ceasefire while Whitman reloaded his rifle. But after walking just a hundred yards away from the tower, Whitman spotted them and opened fire. Nancy was shot in the hip, 
and through some hideous stroke of misfortune, the shot ricocheted off a stone pillar and flew back at Ellen, striking her in the leg. The next unfortunate souls spotted by Whitman were two 17-year-old high school students named Alec Hernandez and Karen Griffith. Hernandez was shot in the leg while delivering newspapers on his bicycle, while Griffith's right lung was pierced after being shot in the chest. Hernandez survived his wound while Griffith would pass away in the hospital seven days later. A UT student named Thomas Carr ran to their aid after seeing them hit the ground. Whitman would shoot them through the spine as he tried to stem the bleeding of Karen Griffith's wound, and he passed away within the hour. Moments later, 23-year-old David Gunby remembered he'd left one of his books at the university library. As he walked to retrieve it, one of Whitman's bullets tore through his upper left arm and entered his abdomen, slicing up his small intestine as it did so. After Gunby was shot, teenagers Adrian and Brenda Littlefield, who had gotten married just nine days earlier, were shot as they exited the UT Austin main building. Both would survive their injuries and were some of the first to be rescued by first responders when an armored car arrived on campus to evacuate the wounded. 18-year-old Claudia Rutt and her boyfriend Paul Bolton Sontag had just bumped into a close friend of theirs, Carla Wheeler, when they heard the gunshots. All immediately ran for cover, but during a brief lull in the shooting, Paul stood up to look around. Whitman saw him, aimed his rifle, and shot him through the head killing him instantly. Claudia then rushed to Paul's aid while Carla trying to restrain her to prevent her from being shot. Whitman aimed at them and fired, sending a bullet into Claudia's chest. She too would pass away from her wounds almost immediately. At the time of the shooting, Paul Sontag's grandfather was the acting news director of a local news station. Tragically, he only learned of his grandson's death when the victim's names were read out live on air. When he heard the shooting commence, 29-year-old electrician Roy Schmidt dove into cover, but like Paul Sontag, he revealed himself during a brief law in the shooting. Whitman put a bullet through his abdomen from over 400 meters away, and over the next 30 minutes or so, he slowly and painfully bled to death. Shortly afterward, 24-year-old Billy Paul Speed would become the only police officer to be killed in the shooting. Speed was taking cover behind some decorative balusters on Austin's South Mall, and Whitman managed to put a bullet in him through a small gap in the masonry. Speed was rushed to a hospital not long after, but died during emergency surgery. PhD student Harry Walchuk was then shot in the chest while leaving a magazine store on Guadalupe Street, while UT basketball coach Billy Snowden was struck in the shoulder while standing in a barbershop doorway. Abdul Kashab, a 24-year-old exchange student from Iraq, was then shot near the corner of Guadalupe and 24th Street. His fiancée, Janet Palos, would also take one of the Whitman's bullets shortly before 21-year-old Sandra Wilson was shot. 21-year-old Lana Phillips was then shot through the shoulder before Oscar Roy Vela and his girlfriend Irma Garcia were shot near Hogg Auditorium. A shot then struck 26-year-old carpenter Avelino Esparza's left arm, shattering the bone, just before Marine veteran Robert Hurd was shot. 18-year-old John Scott Allen was looking at the tower through a window of the student union when a bullet smashed the glass. Whitman fired with such speed and accuracy that his second shot severed an artery in Allen's right forearm. 30-year-old funeral director Morris Homan was using his business's ambulance to take victims to the hospital when he was shot in his right leg. He later recalled, I'd laid there for about 40 to 45 minutes, listening to two construction workers arguing about who was going to expose themselves to recover me. F.L. Foster and Robert Frieda were then wounded by friendly fire when they passed in the way of bullet exchange between Whitman and police officers shooting from the ground. This was quickly followed by two visiting Mexican tourists, Della and Marina Martinez, being wounded by bullet fragments. Dolores Ortega then suffered a cut on the back of her head, caused either by flying glass or one of Whitman's bullets. Within just 30 minutes, the University of Austin's campus had transformed from a peaceful place of learning to a veritable war zone, 
with scores of police officers laying down covering fire as assault teams rushed the main building's front entrance. A police sharpshooter in a small plane was driven back by Whitman's return fire, but continued to circle at a distance, seeking to distract Whitman and further limit his freedom to choose targets. Whitman then began to fire through a storm drain at the foot of the observation deck's wall, continuing to target police officers on the ground as others rushed up the building's stairs. First to reach the 27th floor were officers Jerry Day and Houston McCoy, who were accompanied by off-duty police officer Ray Martinez and a retired Air Force tail gunner named Alan Crum. One of the first wounded people they encountered was 19-year-old Mike Gabber, one of Whitman's first victims. Mike gestured to the observation deck and weakly told the man, he's out there. Ray Martinez was the first man onto the observation deck, telling Alan Crum to remain at the door. Jerry Day and Houston McCoy reached the observation deck just moments later. Then, at around 1.24 p.m., Martinez and McCoy rounded the northeastern corner of the observation deck. Martinez opened fire on Whitman, but missed all six shots of his revolver. McCoy then leaped out while Martinez was firing and saw Whitman's head looking over a light ballast. McCoy fired at the top of the ballast, hitting Whitman between the eyes with several pellets. Whitman died instantly, but Officer Martinez was so terrified that he grabbed a spare shotgun, ran over to Whitman's lifeless body, and fired a shotgun blast directly into his left arm. Martinez then had to take cover as officers on the ground, who didn't realize Whitman was down, continued to pepper the observation deck with rounds. One of the worst mass shootings in U.S. history was finally over. But the painful aftermath of the 16 murders and countless injuries had just begun. Immediately following the shootings, the main building's observation deck was closed off to the public. After repairs were made, the tower was reopened in 1968, but was closed off again seven years later following a quick succession of people taking their lives. The university then installed a stainless steel lattice and other security features, and it was reopened again in 1999 but admission was purely by appointment only and all visitors were screened by metal detectors. UT Texas then established its very own police force, one of the first in the country, and graduates of its police academy still undergo a wide variety of training programs designed to help them prepare to combat threats if local SWAT teams are unavailable. In 2006, a memorial garden was dedicated to those who died. And the day it was open, the tower's clock was stopped for 24 hours beginning at 11.48 a.m., with the day itself being declared Ray Martinez Day. Following Whitman's death, but not as a result of his last wishes, an autopsy was performed on his body, with a particular focus on the man's brain. This was how doctors discovered a small brain tumor pressing up against his amygdala, and there was some speculation as to whether or not this contributed to his state of mind preceding the shooting. One doctor stated that, It is the opinion of the task force that the relationship between the brain tumor and Whitman's actions cannot be established with clarity. However, it's conceivable that the tumor contributed to his inability to control his emotions and actions. Yet, another forensic investigator theorized that since the tumor was pressing up against Whitman's amygdala, part of the brain related to anxiety and fight-or-flight responses, that it's almost certain that it contributed in some way. A joint Catholic funeral service for Whitman and his mother was held in Lake Worth's Hillcrest Memorial Park on August 5th of 1966. Since he was a military veteran, Whitman was buried with military honors. His casket was draped with the American flag. This caused outrage among the American public who believed that no such honors should have been bestowed on a mass murderer such as he. Although Whitman's actions have all been forgotten about by some Americans, millions were haunted by his actions and characters in the years that followed. Perhaps one of the most succinct diatribes was written by Texan country singer Kinky Friedman, who actually graduated UT Austin during the same year as the shooting. In his song, The Ballad of Charles Whitman, Friedman sings... The doctors tore his poor brain down, but not a snitch of illness could be found. Most folks couldn't figure out just why he did it, and them that could would not admit it. 
where there's still a lot of Eagle Scouts around. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And be sure to take out your Furby's batteries before bed.